National Indigenous. Oops. Um, it's National Indigenous Peoples Day, and for me, it's a day of celebrating um, Indigenous culture and contributions um, to the land and people um, of Turtle Island. It's also a holiday for many Indigenous people, and I wanted to say chi miigwech to those who are here working with us today to support nourish and reconciliation on their day off. Um, so by all of us gathering here today, it shows that we're ready and already making some really good changes. And many of us have had opportunities to work together to create proper access for Indigenous communities by addressing some of the wicked problems and access barriers that have been created by colonialism. So some of which are in the form of food sovereignty, um, some of it is clean water, and then also proper health care. So if you could share in the chat, um, which I think is at the bottom right of your screen, um, who you are and where you're from, and maybe share a little bit about why you're here today. Um, and if you're feeling comfortable, maybe something about something that you've been reflecting on or something you would like to understand better or something that you would like to share about your experience with food as our medicine. So as we go along, if thoughts and questions arise for you, please feel free to put them in the chat and we can answer as we go along or also at the end. And we are gonna pause for um, questions in, in the middle of the webinar as well. So we're trying to leave lots of room for conversations. Um, so as I shared earlier, I follow the seven grandfather teachings, and one of those teachings is bravery. So I'm going to encourage everybody to be brave and speak your truth today and ask questions and share your thoughts. Um, it's a safe space, and it's a really good day to learn new things and ways of doing. So we're all here um, to work towards bringing traditional food ways through food, and um, it's challenging work. So um, I don't think I can say this enough but please be brave and be patient with yourself and ask questions because we're here to support one another today. Um, something that I've been reflecting on for the last little while and would like to share is actually a, a reiteration of what I've been hearing by communities and elders and knowledge keepers and indigenous leaders for a number of years now and that how it is so very important, not only on this day of National Indigenous Peoples Day, but for every day, to celebrate and work towards reconciliation. So by repairing relationships, not only with each other, but also with the land and with our water. So I hope today when we leave, we feel more inspired to continue to do, to do the good things um, for each other, but also for the land and for the water that feeds us. Um, so turning to the slides, uh, I think we can share the slides here. Perfect, thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm really excited that everybody's here today on National Indigenous Peoples Day, and we're also celebrating one year of Food is Our Medicine. Um, and I'm really excited to listen to Jenny and Margaret and Shelley share their stories and teachings of the salmon and how they work uh, with traditional foods in their community and their healthcare organizations in Haida Gwaii. Um, but before um, I introduce and we get a little bit further, we have a few things to share, and we'd like to take a few minutes to um, talk about the people who have been participating in Food is Our Medicine. So I started to make this map a little bit late, so it's not completely up to date, um, but the purple captures some of the areas where people have completed their learning journeys, and the blue captures some of the organizations where folks are working through their learning journey. So we can share this link um, on our website after we're finished. Um, I have been working on it, but then I've also been um, trying to keep up to date with all the folks that have been contributing um, and signing up for their learning journey. So on the next slide, I'm pleased to share that we have around 1,072 people from across Turtle Island who are working on their learning journeys. And I updated this morning, so it's from over 484 different organizations and 131 individuals have completed, which I think is pretty outstanding. Um, and with that, I'd like to share a beautiful reel that uh, Rachel made for us today. And it captures beautifully um, just the past year that we've had. Rachel's gonna cue that up for us.
language, Rachel. It's so beautiful. And um, we've had more people join and finish since you worked on that, I think, which was over the weekend. <laughs> so congratulations, everybody. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Jen, to share some thoughts and big thanks um, to those who have been contributing as well. Yeah, it's hard for our small team to keep pace with uh, all the changes that are happening and keeping everything up to date. So it's just amazing that um, everyone is progressing in their learning journey. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm one of the co-directors of Nourish, Jen Reynolds, and I work and live on unceded territory where the Kinikikaha Nation is recognized as custodians of the lands and waters. And I'm going to read my comments today because I end up getting very emotional, as my team knows, or you may have seen me. Um, and I really want to be able to, uh, a lot of pressure on me to thank everybody who has been involved in the learning journey and to make sure that everybody is recognized. Um, and this has had, like, this work has really evolved over many years. So there's been uh, content offered, inspiration and guidance to create this wonderful polished learning journey and the rich resource library and the animation of webinars and learning circles and a whole range of print materials and pins and physical artifacts going out into the world and all in support of creating, enhancing that wonderful vision um, to bring an understanding into healthcare that food is medicine. Um, and this vision, I also wanna thank and recognize um, some of the roots of this work coming from the traditional food work of the First Nourish cohort. And um, a number of innovators are here today and continue to be active um, members of, of this work. And um, I want to recognize our funders who've supported us, um, the Frontline Fund, the McConnell Foundation and the Arrow Family Foundation have really enabled us to um, create this learning journey and experience and offer it to um, healthcare professionals from across Turtle Island who've been able to engage and hearten us actually, um, despite the pandemic significant impact on, on the sector and on society. We just feel really grateful um, for everybody to take on this work uh, during this time. Um, uh, so I wanted to specifically turn to thank some of the contributors to the learning journey and um, their names are in no particular order. I tried to keep it alphabetical. Myers coached me here and hopefully um, it's always the worst when you miss someone. So um, we have a thank you slide here and I just wanted to feature the writers. Um, I think they had a special role in really um, crafting and presenting beautiful language and questions for all of us um, to shape the learning journey. So specifically, uh, Tara Lynn Fern, Melanie Goodchild, Meyer Greenfield, Tessie Harris, Haley LaPalm, and Elisa Levi. And um, I'm not going to name the many other content contributors or reviewers, um, but um, they're listed here. Um, I also want to specifically name and recognize the support of um, Nourishes Indigenous and Allies Advisory. Um, their guidance and um, direction and contribution to this learning journey is, um, uh, I think, cannot be said enough. So um, a big thank you to Shelley Crack, to Jenny Cross, Margaret Edgers, Kelly Gordon, Mae Henderson, Kathy Loon, Maurice Mathieu, uh, Mika Obwe, Charlotte Peter Burns, and Laura Salmon. And I want to have a third recognition for the beautiful visual elements that have been woven throughout this past year. Um, designers, artists, videographers, animators. So specifically to name those collaborators, um, Bright Web, uh, Brittany Goche, I forgot to say Beaters, uh, Rally Rally, uh, Myra Mayesa Wij, I'm sorry, I got her name wrong, Mia Wasij, uh, Rachel Chang, Lindsay Sarazen, and Sarah Cornwick. And I want to thank all of you today for joining us um, for a day that is really important to us as an organization and our approach into wide seeing. Um, and I want to thank you all for registering for this learning journey and to celebrate wherever you are at that, at that stage. If you're at the beginning stages, partway or finished, um, we really appreciate your, as Meyer framed at the beginning, your time and your questions and your openness to, to um, undertake this process. Um, and I wanted to also make a special thank you to Maya herself, because uh, I don't think she would do that <laughs> unless I do that for her, obviously. Um, and she has really um, just shown such deep dedication and perseverance. Um, and, you know, in addition to what you perceive as the experience, the lovely writing and the polished learning journey, these beautiful webinars, 
um, that she crafts and works with so many collaborators to um, bring to you. Behind the scenes, there has been a lot of hard work and a lot of late nights and weekend work that I wanted to recognize. So spreadsheets, testing online platforms, and mailing out packages of posters and beads to those who've completed the journey. So um, I just wanted to give you a heartfelt thanks, Meyer, for, for doing this work and your wholehearted efforts. Thank you. Thank you much, Jen. Um, it's so nice to revisit and hear all the people that have been involved. Um, over the last six years and I'm um, to acknowledge and I'm just really thankful. And actually I'm gonna tell you a story about um, mailing the packages because it's kind of like my nerd moment. <laughs> I always uh, get really excited because the post office is right across the street from my house. So I get to walk across um, with the packages and I'm always walking across with a smile on my face. And then I hand them over all proud to, to the post lady with a big giant smile. Um, but one day I had a huge stack um, from Nossum and UBC and I went to the mailbox and I put it in the mailbox but then they all got stuck in there and so I was trying to get them in and they wouldn't go down and it was like a little bit of a rain and I was actually talking to Robin on the phone but then a man came behind and he was trying to mail his letter which is kind of strange in this day and age that there's a lineup at the mailbox and I was trying to, I had my arm in there and I was trying to push them in and they wouldn't go in. And it kind of looked like I was stealing from the mailbox and also talking to myself because I had Robin in my ear. So it was, it was kind of a funny moment, but um, yeah, thank you for that, Jen. And I'd also like to acknowledge the, the nurse team as well. So Robin Speedy and Shelby Montgomery for their support. And of course you, Jen, for helping and guiding along the way and Haley who is off right now. And then especially um, Rachel Chang, who is always presenting and representing um, Nourish's work in such a beautiful, meaningful way and is always game to um, add a, a lot of beauty to this. So I think we all need a virtual round of applause for everybody that uh, has been involved. So thanks everybody. I know we can't hear each other, but <laughs> make which. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to go to the next slide and we're gonna do a little recap of this past year's webinars and then we'll pass it over to to Shelley. So uh, we kicked off in March um, with our official launch and then we had our first seasonal webinar in June. So if we go to the next slide, you can see where we celebrated summer. Um, and we thought it was important to start by sharing with an understanding of cultural mindfulness, um, which is important when understanding why our food system is the way it is today. Um, it's important to understand how it became that way and understanding the history of this um, how residential schools and Indian hospitals and food control and colonialism are just pieces of this puzzle of why we're here today. Um, so learning all of this, um, it needs to be understood and a step um, to bringing traditional ways back. So we heard from my friend and helper George Cucci from Nixing First Nation. So on cultural mindfulness, which is his name, um, which is also known as cultural safety or cultural training, um, we just prefer to use this language of mindfulness because it helps us to envision a more gentle approach, I think, to learning uh, about Indigenous communities. And to me, it also follows the seven grandfathers of kindness and humility. And so from Indigenous perspective, we share cultural mindfulness with open hearts and open minds and hope that those who are learning also come in with this openness. So I'd like a, to extend a chimigwich or a big thank you to George for all his support. Uh, we also share some of his resources and the learning journey, which some of you have seen. Um, and our next slide, um, our next webinar was our fall. Uh, we were able to listen and speak with Kitty Arlen Lickers from Six Nations Health Services, who spoke about food um, and, and culture for her and her community. And then we also heard from Kelly Gordon um, from Six Nations and who is also a past innovator and contributed to um, Food is Our Medicine in a big way. And um, she's also a current co-chair of our Nourish Indigenous and Allies Advisory. So one of my favorite moments is when um, Kelly shared how she took a trip to the cornfield with some of her patients. And she shared how food is more than medicine um, coming from a nourishing perspective. It's also medicine for your mental health and well-being. Um, she shared how everyone had such a beautiful time in, in that field and they shared so many memories of one another. So I think when you visit your memories of food, of your good memories of food, it's also like medicine for you. Um, so Kelly and Kitty also shared harvest stories, um, including the story of the three sisters and traditions around harvesting and preparing different types of corn. 
So I'd like to say to you, Miigwech, to Kelly and Kitty for all their support uh, with Food is Our Medicine as well. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we met again in February uh, with a focus on food as relationships. And we heard how language uh, knowledge keeper of Nishnabewin, Tori Fisher, who also taught me how to um, say who I am and where I'm from in Nishnabewin, and his partner, Tam. And they shared how they pass their knowledge to their daughters and why it's so important for Indigenous communities to pass uh, knowledge on to the next generation. Um, Tori also shared how traditional foods um, are medicine, because when you eat traditional foods, not only are you getting the nutrients from the food itself, but you're getting the nutrients that that animal has been eating in the bush. So medicines like cedar and birch bark tips. Um, on our next slide, um, I just want to share that's a very short summary of the so many wonderful things that have happened throughout the last year. Um, we will be taking a break from the learning journey for the summer, but we will be back this fall. So I just won't be keeping uh, close tabs on the, the email, but um, you still can continue with your learning journey if you would like. Um, when we come back, we're going to be offering virtual learning circles for learners to connect with each other about Indigenous foodways and to offer a more supportive role for teams in long-term care. So watch for our updates this fall. And with that, I think we're ready to hear from our special guests. So I'll hand the Zoom over to Shelly Crack to introduce herself, along with um, Jenny Cross and, and Margaret Edwards. So miigwech. Hello, everybody. Um, happy Indigenous Aboriginal Day to, across the, uh, the country. Mm -hmm. And um, can you introduce yourself, or should I? Yeah. Uh, my name is Shelly Crack. I'm um, on the sitting on the unceded territory of the Haida Nation with Jenny and um, I've been working here as a dietitian for the last 18 years, working on with Margaret and Jenny getting traditional food in the hospital. And uh, yeah, it feels like a real privilege to be uh, a settler on this land and presenting today on this important day. So thank you for this opportunity. And um, should I get Margaret to introduce herself? Mm -hmm. Margaret, do you want to uh, unmute and introduce yourself? I think Maya or Robin, yeah, Rachel might be able to unmute Margaret. And hopefully it won't be at the same time as she manages to do it and redo it. <laughs> I can't unmute her for some reason. Okay, got it. Okay, I'm Margaret Edgar, and I'm uh, elder from Haida Gwaii, and I'm so privileged to be on there with you all. And uh, I wish there was a better way to uh, introduce the um, salmon. Welcome back, salmon but uh, it didn't fall through. So I have to speak it from my heart and um, let you know what goes on with the salmon ceremony. It's a, it's a um, respected way of um, welcoming back our salmon in our Yakun River. And, it used to be really big at one time. It sort of died down, but I sort of suggested that we try to video it to do it for today, but it didn't happen. So I'm glad that I'm able to say a little bit about it. Anyway, we have a little ceremony up in the river and we usually get a donation of um, sockeye 
to do the ceremony. What we do is um, slice the fish, the flesh off the bone, and use the bone to do the um, ceremony by the riverside. And we get one of our younger ones to take the um, bone out to the river after we slice the meat off the bone. And that's our um, power to the river and our creator for putting the fish in the river for us. So we share, say a prayer, sing a haida, a song for the salmon. And we were privileged to have, um, well, what was her name? Erica? Yeah, Erica to do the song for the salmon. And it was, it was really touching to hear her singing about the salmon. So I'm glad that happened. So this is really important for us to do the ceremony in order to respect the river, the creator, for putting the salmon in the river for us. And we always say that we can't go without doing it because if we don't continue our tradition, we won't have any fish because uh, we lost our way of saying how to our creator. So I was glad that a few of our elders always continue to do this ceremony. We usually have a nice picnic after, but this is so important. So we ended up having to do it whether it was raining or sunshine or rain. And it was raining really hard that day. We did it this um, I forget when it was, Sally, help me. Last Sunday? I think it was three weeks ago now, Margaret. Oh my goodness. We did it three weeks ago and it was raining, raining hard. But we still continue to do it because it's so important. So, okay. Anything? Yeah, we do a little prayer service and get the young kids to put the bone back in the river. But it was uh, one of our elders that did it because it was too wet and we didn't want uh, the kids to slip around and get it, fall in the river. So. I was really happy that it happened because we always um, end up doing our ceremony too late when the fish is all already gone up the river. So I can't remember how many years it's been happening. It's been a long time. Nearly every year we've been doing it for about uh, Oh, 30 years since I've been doing it with my auntie. So I'm happy that she continues to do this. I think that's it. How oh, well. oh, did I say? How oh, Margaret yeah. for sharing about the ceremony. And I think we're going to still try and create a, a video of that uh, event and share it out to, to Meyer and Nourish over the next coming months. So yeah. stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> and now Jenny, I'm gonna pull up your presentation after the interview. Sing Lai La, everyone. Good morning. Kunajit Hanudi Kaya Baba. 
My name is Jenny Cross. My Haida name is Kunajit. I'm happy to be here with all of you this morning to share the importance about salmon. I give thanks to our elder Margaret Edgars for always being there with us as our support. Um, it's important to have our elders as our support team and I'm very thankful for Margaret for always being there with us. Um, today I have a bunch of slides uh, to show you, um, but before I do, I just like to talk about the salmon a bit. The salmon is the main staple in our diet and our food system. In Haida, we call it China. And the salmon carries a lot of omega-3 protein, healthy fats, and China plays a significant role in our spiritual and cultural identity. The salmon is a symbol of the cycle of life, perseverance, self-sacrifice, and regeneration. Salmon is highly respected and treated accordingly. It is an important gift from the creator. Therefore, we honor salmon in ceremonies of giving thanks for the continuous cycle and return to our creeks, rivers, and life in the ocean where they spend most of their lives. Upon their return to creeks, rivers, to spawn and die, they carry nutrients within their bodies to feed the forest beds and all the plant life. So salmon is such a very important staple. Um, Shelly is going to be showing some slides that I have. Sorry. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had it, Shelley. Yeah. Come on. We saw them earlier, so we know they're there. Yeah. <laughs> Just finding the right tab. There we go. Okay, so honoring the salmon, China. Um, there's such a, um, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts here. So the salmon, to prepare salmon, there's many different steps in the process of canning salmon. It's not just about sitting at your table and enjoying, enjoying the salmon that's on your plate. It, it entails so much more to get that salmon to our plate. So the, the pictures that you see on the screen are just a variety of ways that we prepare our salmon. Um, we enjoy the salmon heads and we offer it to our ancestors in the traditional fires. Um, we make fish strips in Haida, we call it chilchi. In their Massa dialect, Margaret's dialect, it's called chilch. And then we can our salmon, um, and that in itself is a uh, process. And then um, cutting the salmon, so shall I can go to the next screen? So before we begin, um, preparing our salmon, we need a net um, to fish in our rivers. So how is this net made? We don't just buy it in the store. It is made by our people. And it's a skill to make a, a net. Um, this is a net that belongs to my family. My husband made it. He was taught when he was 12, 13 years old by elders in our community. He attended a net mending course and he learned the traditions of net mending. And um, family members seek him out to build their nets for, for them for our, our Copper River fishing. We have a traditional um, fishing village. It's called Copper Bay. And it's on um, 
on the Graham Island side of Haida Gwaii. We have to travel by ferry to reach our fishing camp. And um, this is the type of net that we use for fishing. And the next slide is um, like preparing a net, cleaning the net after the net is brought up from the rivers, the creeks, the ocean, then you have to clean it for the next opening. We have uh, openings that happen um, every weekend um, in the month of May and June, like mid May to mid June, we have weekend openings where we do our fishery. So there's so much um, work entailed. In it. So in this, in these slides is my husband, Robert, and two of our sons who are helping their father clean the net and just getting it ready. And then we have a, a fish drying rack that needs to be built to hold your net for cleaning and keeping it dry and keeping it um, so that, you know, the web doesn't rot or or, you know, from the rain or the elements. And the next slide is like our, our net rack, and that's our smokehouse in the background. The Haida word for smokehouse is tananai. And the Haida word for net is ahada. And um, just in the past eight years, uh, we discovered that we were able to catch our, our blueback, which is a young sockeye, here in front of our house, we didn't have to travel to our fish camp. We decided just one weekend to put the net out and lo and behold, that fish hit our net. So it was a pretty exciting time when we were able to discover that we could catch fish right in our front yard. We live, our house is situated right on the beach. So um, we don't have to travel far to, um, to get our prized fish. So this is like right in my front yard. Um, that's my husband in there um, getting ready to check the net and checking the net. Uh, so it's like a, a big process to get our fish to our plate and to nourish our bodies. So, so this is a process um, that brings us to it. And there's our low tide. My husband goes out to check the net and our two of our grandkids are, are playing nearby. This was quite a few years ago. Our grandchildren are now um, 15 and 13. But my husband's checking a net and making sure there's uh, it's not tangled up for the incoming tide. So this is like just in front of our house, which is so amazing. And the next slide is, um, this is this year. Uh, when the tide is low, um, it's kind of tough to get the boat down to the to the beach. So my husband and, and three of our three of our sons are helping their dad pack the boat down so he can go out and check the net. And this is my hus picture. My husband, our our neighbor, captured this picture. This is like five thirty in the morning, six in the morning. My husband went out on the on the tide to check the net. And this is him on the boat. And the picture on the left is my husband and our oldest grandson. Uh, we caught a little trout in our net. And my husband is showing our grandson and he put it in his hand and the fish start wiggling away and our grandson is laughing. And then the picture on the right is my, my great nephew when my husband came in from checking the net, my nephew and his sister went down to the boat and they were sitting in there and they were handling the fish and all excited. So he's got a big smile on his face. And then this is our catch. So my husband brought the, the blue back up. Um, this is the one on the right is this year. We caught uh, 21 fish for the three weekends, four weekends that it was open. And the first fish, that's the first fish that my husband has. So the first fish we enjoy, like on the barbecue, 
like it's it's a ceremony when you have your very first catch and um usually like our my husband's cousins who's a neighbor he would come by and enjoy enjoy the fish with us around the fire or people would stop by when they see the smoke coming from our fire and fire pit and they would come and sit and join us and so sharing sharing our wealth is a part of our life this slide is our daughter um she went up uh to talal river and caught a coho with her auntie and her dad is guiding her in in how to clean it so this is her um doing the the uh, splitting process and that's her again like you have to get all the fins off and um prepare the fish and so she's getting guided through this process by by her dad and i and this is my auntie ethel moody she was a cook in the queen charles hospital dodging gates hospital for 20 years so this is her preparing a spring salmon to feed the, get, the patients. And so this had to have been taken probably, uh, I think 1969, I think was when this picture was taken. So we did have traditional foods in our hospitals at one time. And then, um, uh, how would you say the bureaucracy got in the way? And now we're trying to bring it back slowly. But surely we're getting it back to this point where it was. Um, fishermen would donate fish all the time to the hospital, and my auntie and her helpers would prepare it and and give it to the patients. And you know our food is healing, so the patients not only receive something that is like fresh out of the ocean, but they also receive something that was going to nourish their body, something that was going to bring them good healing energy when they're in the hospital. Because when you're in the hospital, when you're eating the hospital food, it's not the same as when you're getting traditional foods because uh, hospital food is just like packaged food that doesn't carry any value in it versus traditional foods that carry so much value, so many nutrients and, and so many, like, like when you're sitting there eating, enjoying it, it just brings up all these memories of, of days gone by and our ancestors and, and how much they have enjoyed our foods. So this is our, again, this is our blueback from our Copper River, um, Tahit, we call it in Haida, a young sockeye. So this is preparing it to be placed in the jars. Um, like each, um, oh, how do I say it? Like there's different processes for different ways of preparing fish. So but this is for like plain canning fish. And then there's like smoke canning fish. So this is plain canning. And um, I have learned from my mother how, how to prepare our fish for canning and how to work in the smokehouse when we were young uh, preteens she used to take my brothers and I down to the beach and gather um, waterlogged a wood to put in the smokehouse that would keep the fire going overnight or she would take us down to the smokehouse and we would help her turn the fish in the smokehouse I think the next slide might be the smokehouse um, so this is my grandmother. This is in 1967. So this is the technique of, of canning the plain sockeye. So in this picture, you can see some cans sitting on there on the table. And then to the left, uh, my husband's uncle um, is situated with one of the old style winding canners. That's a, uh, a canning um, device that uh, was used quite frequently in the past and that's how our mother taught us as well with uh, this way of canning 
Uh, there's not a lot of people who do that technique nowadays. We have just a few families who do it here in Skidigat that do it the old fashioned way. So our mom, when she would can it, we'd have a big barrel, a barrel drum, and we have a fire outside and we put the cans in this big drum and, and have a fire underneath and just have the fire continuously going until the canning is ready, like three and a half hours, say three and a half hours or something. Then we would take the wood from underneath the fire and let it cool off. And then we take it out of the drum. So it's a very long process to, to preparing our, our salmon. And I'm very um, thankful to those who have passed down the techniques to us. I, I don't use a canner anymore because uh, you have to use a certain device in the canner to make sure that um, uh, the canner is like balanced. And I, I forgot that technique as years went by after my mom passed away. So I don't use that canning method anymore. I stick with the jars that was shown in the previous slide. So the next slide shows um, preparing the fish or the smokehouse. Um, the stick that the fish is hanging on, we have a hiding name for it. That's our casin sticks that's made out of cedar. Um, we cut our fish um, to half smoke it. And we call that spetchial in Haida is a half smoked fish. And then the picture on the left, I mean, I'm uh, sorry, picture on the right is like the peppering spices that we put on our fish. Um, every family has their secret recipes. I we have our mom's secret recipe and her spices that she puts on it. And, and uh, this is like a very, oh, this is so good. I'm my mouth watering. And then this is the, the fish strips that we do in Haida we call a chilji. So we make these tiny little fish strips from the salmon um, before we uh, bring it to the process of smoking it. And then we, we put it in the smokehouse um, for a certain amount of time. And then we take it out and we put it on these, um, we call it chilji sticks, like this dry fish strip sticks made out of cedar. And we put it on those to, to um, dry our chilji. Oh boy, that looks so good. <laughs> so this is on my front porch and then this is inside my house. And then this is the dried fish strips hanging in our smokehouse. And then enjoying the first salmon, like I said, when we make, we either barbecue it or we would make a fish soup. How do we call it jam? So it's just potatoes, onions, and fish. And then you put um, ulican grease and, and seaweed on it in the bowl. So this is like, it's gotta be one of the best soups ever and so nutritious. The next slide um, on the left is our, our fish heads. We call it um, uh, China, uh, China Kaji fish head. And on the right is my auntie. I brought her, I cooked her a fish head and I brought it to her about a month ago and I sat there while she enjoyed it and took her picture. She has the fish heads and the tails in her plate and just that and potatoes. And she enjoyed it so much. And our, our people love to eat the cooked eyeballs. I, I'm still trying to, um, I can eat maybe one, but our, our, our elders and even our children and our family, our daughter and our granddaughter and one of our sons, they really love fish heads. And on this plate is enjoying the salmon. Um, you see the fish eggs there that we, we bake the fish eggs, like every part of the fish is utilized. Everything, the only thing that, uh, really is thrown away is the guts. So we, we eat the bones, we smoke the bones, we um, bake the fish eggs and we bake the tails and the heads. So this is 
um, like the Haida word for fish eggs is chai. So we enjoy the whole um, variety of parts of the fish. And this is the dried fish skins. Um, in the Haida, we call it um, katu. Um, and we cut it in strips and we eat the strips. Uh, we, we bake it in the oven or over the fire. Uh, put a lot of salt on it and we eat it and enjoy it. Uh, this picture here is, uh, we had a, a picnic for our, I work at the Aboriginal Head Start Parent Top Program. So we had our families down at our barbecue pit and we we were gifted this these fish skins to enjoy with all our families. And, and oh, it was so delicious. We, have, uh, we had a Haida elder who worked in our program. She was 93 years old um, and still working at our program. And she passed away about three, four years ago. So she, she um, her niece gifted this to us to enjoy. And this again is the uh, fish strips, the chilji, and then the, we have um, herring roe and kelp, and it's a dried method. So that's how we eat it. We eat the fish strips with the dried, we call it cow, dried cow, and then we dip it in oolican grease or we put butter on it. And oh boy, it's nothing better and more healing and nutritious. And the, these slides, is fishing at our Copper River. This is my nephew. My nephew Wade fishing their net in front of his parents' cabin. They set the net right in front of their cabin on the river. And this is him checking a net and taking a fish out of the net and um, taking one of one or two of his children out um, for the process of you know setting net, checking a net. So it's just passing down knowledge. So this is him taking a blue back out of the, the net. The next slide is um, my nephew again with his dad, my oldest brother, Alfie, um, getting a net ready to set it. So they're just like separating the net and so that they can just put it into the boat so that it's easy to set it when you're rowing out, rowing across the river. And the next slide is, again, that's, they're getting the net ready to um, bring it across the river. And this is a different river that we do fishing in. This is a, like a, uh, where a lot of the coho come up in Talal River. And we go up there with our fishing rods and this is our daughter, Shyla fishing at the Talal River. And that's her and her dad fishing. Once in a while we go up to the Talal River and like probably on um, uh, September long weekend and we go and just sit in and enjoy the fish life at the Talal River. And that's our grandsons and one of our sons, he caught a fish and so he got it onto the ground and he's like, you know, um, dealing with it so that, and then the grand, the, our grandsons are watching him. Again, more fishing on the Talal River. Beautiful sunny day. Our families are, our children and all our children are there participating in this fishing and we take turns with the fishing rods and just enjoy the time together. And that's what it's all about fishing is, is enjoying your family time and passing on knowledge and enjoying your catch together and, and but like just passing on knowledge and carrying on traditions. And this is another type of fishing. This is our food fishery. Um, my late father, Chief Skittig at Dempsey Collinson, owned three seine boats and he would go out on a food fishery and bring it in and feed the communities of Skidigit and Queen Charles City and Sanspit and Massapport, like 
pretty well the whole island would get a feed from his food fishery. On the left is my late brother, um, just preparing um, one of the fish that he caught. And on the right is another food fishery. And my husband in the middle, um, everybody with their big catch that they will enjoy when they get home, share with their families. And this is my dad on the left, um, late, Skidigit, late Chief Skidigit Dempsey Collinson um, at the wheel, place that he loved, um, feeding the communities on his fish boats. And the picture on the right is my husband. Uh, he was a beach man when he was a fisherman. So this is him coming down to the boat when the boat make, makes a set and the boat comes in. So he has to run down to to the skiff that comes in to pick them up when they're closing up the net, the circle net. So that's him running down the beach. And this is a recipe from my dad's dad for um, fish cakes. He was famous for his fish cakes. Um, we all got to enjoy his fish cakes. So we had a recipe, uh, a cookbook that was put out in our community. And, and one of his recipes was submitted in, in this cookbook. It was called Halagata, which means come and eat. And the next one is where I have prepared the salmon patties to be fried. So that's getting the salmon patties ready. And you have to put a paste, a paste on, on the salmon patties before you fry it. And then the next slide is the uh, salmon patties when they're frying in the frying pan. Oh man, they're so good. We don't eat them enough as we should because we just uh, have just like plain salmon, but oh, this was so delicious. And this is a picture of me in our Aboriginal Head Start Parent Talk program. Um, we were gifted a, a spring salmon, so I'm teaching the children how to um, prepare the salmon, how to split it, and just talking to them about the importance of, of salmon and, and answering all their questions. and. Um, so the kids got to watch me cleaning it and they really enjoyed that process. And this is a plate offering for the ancestors. Um, it's important to feed our ancestors. Yeah, we are who we are because of our ancestors and in our way of life and our traditions and in um, the foods that they taught us how to prepare. So we give thanks to them for, for just being such an important part of our, our history because our ancestors do get hungry in the spirit world. So it's important to feed them. And it also, like you can feed them many different ways, like in the fire, a sacred fire or in the ocean, or just put the plate on the land and the birds will come and eat it. If you put it in the water, not only you, um, feeding the ancestors like the birds would come and eat it or or other uh, ocean life would come and feed on the plate offering that you're giving them and just giving thanks for salmon for returning to us every year. And the next plate is is putting the plate in the fire fire method secret fire. So this is my plate offering that I do for our ancestors and I do it quite frequently because in my heart, I'm I'm so connected to our ancestors that it's important for me to to feed them and to let them know that we never forget. You know, our traditions carry on to the future. Oh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> okay, so we have a traditional plate here. I have a couple of traditional plates. So I have two, two plate offerings that I prepared. Um, so itla katagai itan hilaga, our food is our medicine. So I have a spirit plate offering that 
I offer to the ancestors. I will offer this tomorrow when we get together with our sacred knowledge keepers. We have a meeting tomorrow, so I'll get our, our Haida ancestors from Skidig and Masset to do Haida prayers and do blessings, and then we can um, offer it to our ancestors tomorrow. But I do um, seafoods from the four seasons are placed on this plate offering and just giving thanks and just um, uh, just acknowledging our ancestors and, and honoring what um, the creator has given to us. Um, and just be thankful and be blessed that we have all of these foods um, that we can offer. I even have oolikins on there at one time on our on Haida Gwaii, we had a Ulkan River, but well, we um, we didn't care for it, and we like over harvested. And uh, um, Creator and the Raven took the river to the mainland many, many years ago, and therefore we were left to barter with the mainland um, communities for the prize at Ulkan. And it's just a reminder to give thanks for what we have in our lives. And this plate offering here is a salmon head. So I have a salmon head, um, a young sockeye, talkit, the blueback, and then I have the fish eggs on here. Um, so the fish eggs, like the salmon come comes in in spawns and just it's a continuous cycle so place it on this food offering and giving thanks that we have continuation and um, that everything comes back and placing it in in the ocean or the river um, so that the ocean remains pristine for the future so that our salmon can return to us every year just putting in the ocean with players with prayers and blessings and giving thanks to the salmon and then I place salmon berries on here um, again, um, like our, our indigenous peoples are connected to the environment, to, to the natural environment. So everything, everything that grows or comes, you know that something else is going to be coming. So say if the, the salmon are, are coming, if the salmon are in, uh, in abundance, then you know that we're going to have lots of salmon. So just that's just one so that's a salmon plate. So hello for listening to me. Let me check in on Margaret. Sure. Margaret, after Jenny's presentation, is there anything else that you want to say? You're just on mute, Margaret. Sorry, I muted you earlier. I think sometimes the space bar works. I don't know, I think. Oh, you had it. Now it's off again, Margaret. You had it though. There, oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, hold the space bar, Margaret, if you can. There you go. Don't let go of it, I think. Oh, there I you just, go. I got to keep holding it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just so happy that Jenny was able to share all that she knows and um, really happy that 
she was able to give it in all uh, the things that has to be she said it all so great and um, glad that she was able to do that because it's so important. Everything she said is so true. You have to be so um, thankful for the creator for what um, the creator has put out there for us for our nourishment. And I'm glad that she is teaching her daughter for such a cycle that we all have to remember to do is teach our young people to continue to do the process in the proper way. And I thank her for her knowledge and I show credit to be down there tomorrow to do the um, the plate for our ancestors. Just say how to her again. How about Margaret for all that you do for us as well? We're blessed to have you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here yet because I've been through so much through my life. I've almost lost my life a few years ago and I'm so happy because I'm glad to have my great grandchildren around me to be happy with me yet. And they and they've learned so much and they've taught me so much. Oh mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How are Jenny? How are Margaret? Um, I think we're going to open it up to some questions now. Um, if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. Um, I see Tyler has his hand up. I'm not sure if that's been up for a while or if the question has been answered. Um, but I see we can allow people to talk. Oh, no, it's down. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Or you can raise your hand. I see in the chat somebody asked a question, how can the bones be used? So we smoke the bones, like we put it in a smokehouse, like you know, when you take the, the bones off, off of the fish, then you tie, tie some line onto like two bones and then you put it over the gas and sticks and then you smoke it. And so when it comes out of the smokehouse, you boil the bones and that was my my mother-in-law my husband's mother's favorite part of the fish was the bones so I, I always smoked them for her when she could no longer when she could no longer um work in a smokehouse I would make sure that I had the bones for her and then I see somebody else um wrote about the the guts guts are very good for the trees and lands yeah that's that's so important that is what it does is that it, it nourishes um, nourishes a forest floor or like we use the fish guts like um, um, like when we're doing our fish and then it creates a lot of juice so we use that juice to put in our, our plants in our gardens because we know that that fish juice is very um, nutrient for for our, our plants and stuff. Um, I have a question. It's more of a technical kind of question. Um, I love to salmon fish, but I salmon fish kind of by like the Sioux and around here. And I really enjoy the, like pulling them out and the, and the fight that it, it, it is just such a thrill just to reel up the, the fish. But I'm wondering if there's like, um, how it is taking them off a, a net. I've never done that before. And if there's if it's like a challenge or if it's just they just come off with ease is kind of what I was wondering about that. Well, it's kind of a technique uh, to take it out of the net. Like there's a, a certain way that you have to take it out of the net. Like you can't take it out like backwards from the net. Like you have to take it from the head out. Mm -hmm. I haven't checked the net in many, many years. 
Uh, I used to when I was younger. My husband and I would go over to our fish camp, but I haven't done it for many, many years. But yeah, it's a, a special technique to get it out of the net. Glitch. I also see that uh, somebody else wrote a comment about not knowing that the salmon brought nutrients to the forest. So what happens is, you know how the bears go and eat the salmon and they take it up to the bank and then they eat just a certain part of the salmon and they leave the rest behind. So that rest that they leave behind or if they pack it into the forest and then the fish rots and then the nutrients go into the trees and the plants. Mm -hmm. Or they would care, or if they, like if eagles go and get a salmon and then, and then it gets dropped in the forest. So everything gets you know, packed into the forest by some animal and that's how the nutrients get into the forest floor. It's really cool. Uh, Robin has a thank you for these special stories. I'd be interested to hear more about how you've seen the land change in time um, in the time you've been following the salmon. You did mention the river earlier. I'm wondering if there's other changes that you've seen. Uh, like in our Copper River, we had a family cabin. One winter a tree fell on it and then we lost a cabin. But anyway, so the bank, uh, like our, our cabin is kind of way up the river. And at big tides, the, the river would come in and it's taken away the bank that was in front of our cabin. So we noticed that like with big tides, it's taken away a lot of the riverbanks. And when it does that, I'm sure that um, it does something for the salmon when it's coming up the river. Some folks are asking if it would be okay to share some of the photos afterwards. And um, if we could share the recipe that you shared. Sure. Yeah. Okay. What are you going to do? just the, the stock numbers have changed. Oh, yeah. The, the stock numbers. Um, like our salmon, I'm just talking about our, our blueback. So what comes in like four year cycles, eh? So if the salmon comes one year, then four years time is when you're going to determine how that stock is. So there has been years where our, our Copper River didn't produce as much of the young sockeye for us. So I'm not a scientist on that part, but yeah, that's, that's what I know. Now the questions are coming in. Um, sorry, I didn't see these ones in the Q&A. How long does it take to prepare the fish? For example, canning and smoking, and how long will it last you? How long does it take to can? Well, you have to cut up the fish, get it ready into the right size pieces for the jars, and then you have to stuff your jars like a certain way. You, know, you put your salt in your jars. You have to seal them, then you put them in your canner with kind of like, like hot water and let it come to a boil. And it depends on what type of um, like plain or smoking, like it's anywhere from, or the type of jars, it's anywhere from three to four hours of boiling. So you're looking like probably an all day process from beginning to end. So at least, um, yeah, I can't even put a timeline on it. No, but, they're canned, how long do they last? And then after they're canned, uh, they can last quite a while. Like the longer it ages, the better it tastes out of the jar. Like if you can the, the fish this year, you wouldn't eat it until next year in order to get like to let it age. And I don't know if I want to put a timeline on how long that lasts, but there, mm -hmm. um, one of our elders in the community said he found some fish from, say, like 
seven years ago when he ate it and it, he enjoyed it. So I don't want to say you can la it'll last a long time because what if what if something happens to the jar like in that time frame like would the jar go bad would the fish go bad so i don't want to say a timeline mm -hmm. right margaret yeah i think if you use a pressure cooker it will last a long time but uh, if you just use a hot water bath i, I wouldn't eat it uh, um maybe 10 or 12 years so it's a good one you can be able to do a pressure cooker i was afraid of pressure cooker at one time yeah. i think i almost blew myself up for doing it too late at night my sister came through and she said what are you doing i was sleeping over the pressure cooker <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm scared of the pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. I'm scared of the pressure cooker too. <laughs> so I think on that note, we're just going to take a five minute break um, and then we'll come back and hear from Shelly and then we'll have some more time for questions. So if we didn't get to your questions um, just now, we, we can get to them um, in a few more minutes. So if you want to take five minutes to get a glass of water or um, stretch your legs, we'll be back in five.
Just checking to see if you're back, Shelly and Jenny. Yeah, we're here. And um, I think there was one question that came up in the chat or the questions that Jenny wanted to address before I start. Yeah. So there was one question about um, uh, who, like, like who looks after like the amount of fish that we're able to catch. So we have our local governing body, Council of the Haida Nations, Haida Fisheries. Um, every year they give us an amount of fish that we're able to harvest. And it used to be 50 fish per family. And I think this year it was lowered to 35. So whether that has to do with the low stock, I'm not sure. Sometimes they give us an accounting when they hand out news flashes to tell us that there's going to be an opening. And in the news flash, they give us the number of fish who have passed over. They have a fish counting plate set in the above, you know, in the river, like way up on the river. And that tells them how much fish has gone by. And when they phone to ask families how much fish they caught, they also ask how many females and how many males were there. So that's how they, they um, keep track of of the how much fish comes out of the river and whether there's more females, more males. And if there's too many females coming out at the beginning of the season, then they wouldn't open it the next weekend and they would open it the following weekend to allow the females to go up the river. And every few years they would send us a newsflash uh, with an accounting of um, years ago, like years back, on how much fish went up the river this year, how much went up the river that year, but we haven't gotten one of those news flashes in a while, so, I, so that's what I can answer for now. How I... Okay, do you think break time's over, Meyer? I think break time's over. It'd be okay. nice to hear from you now, Shelly, too. Okay. Uh, so a big hello to Margaret and Jenny who have mentored me along this, uh, this path for so many years. And you can imagine um, the challenge to, um, it is to, to bring all the sacredness and, and uh, ceremony and respect of all this food into a hospital um, without you know, losing, losing that, that real, the real essence of the importance and that connection. And so this is, this has been the work, um, I think, of a, of the, the role of me as a registered dietitian in the hospital, um, connected to the, to the folks, the, the residents and, uh, and just that, that background in nutrition and food service and the policies that, and legislation of the province and bridging that with what you just heard. Um, and my background, you know, in my training is learning the legislation and the food service. So there's been so much teachings from Margaret and Jenny over the years that take so long to understand and how to bring it in to the hospital in a good way. Um, and, but it does feel like a, a, a real privileged position because I do, I do have the link to the legislation and the rules of the hospital and I, and I, and I would say I'm still such an early learner to the understanding of all, all of the importance of the tradition. So it, it's a bit of a bridge role, I'm going to say, um, to bring it in. And so what I'm going to do is share some slides um, so I could share some pictures for you guys. Um, and uh, I wanted to start with a picture of Roy, uh -huh. um, who was, uh, do you know Roy's Haida name? Kind of us. And Roy, Roy was one of our eldest Haida men. 
Um, we lost them during the pandemic, um, not due to COVID, but we did lose them during that time. Um, and uh, he, he he was such a, a rich Haida speaker. He mm. was, was 95 or 96. 96 year old man and I would spend time with him at his bedside and he would share uh, his book of fishing and he, he loved to tell stories and this was right before COVID Jenny came in and we made a, a beautiful venison stew with her head start program and we brought it up to the long-term care and served it with a bunch of food and all the elders got to enjoy that meal and you could see Roy so happy to see Jenny um, and because we're not, any of us aren't wearing masks, this was before COVID, um, but this was a real motivator to um, make some changes. And we lost Roy and the last thing I got to serve him was scallops. Uh, I brought him a tray, he was quite sleepy, but he, anytime I brought him traditional food, uh -huh. he would always be so grateful. And um, and it, it feels like the elders are the are the you know it's just so the reason why we do this work, um, and I and I just also want to say that before COVID and before Nourish because I was a part of Nourish One, we we spent a lot of time making quite elaborate meals with a bunch of local food. We bring it into the hospital kind of monthly and and bring family members in to visit residents and have a sit down formal meal, um, and all of that got taken away with the, the rules and safety of our elders in the hospital. And I just remember this heavy um, and privileged feeling when I was the only one who actually could bring traditional food in because we weren't, we, there were so many families that were blocked. And, and that's how so, so much, so many of the elders get their traditional food is from family coming in and bringing it. And so when COVID hit, this is when, um, we just sort of changed a little bit of how we did things and, and the importance of bringing this food in became more apparent. So these are some beautiful scallops that were uh, the diver of these uh, scallops was Shane Collison. He went diving for them and um, he donated them to, our, to the elders and uh, Margie Freegan up in the North End helped us cook these up and same with Erica. So I think what I've started to learn is uh, that I always need someone Haida beside me helping me prepare this food because I don't know how to prepare it. You hear all the stories that Jenny shared about how to prepare things in a way that, that, that are good for the elders. And, you know, it doesn't always translate when you write a food safety plan or an internal temperature of how to cook something based on what I have to submit to the environmental health officer. And so here's a picture of Gao. Row, row on kelp and Erica came in. She's a, she's a young Haida woman who, who has so much teachings from her family. And the first time I served Gao, I didn't even rinse it. It was so salty for the elders. And I, it was you just like, you don't know. And so Erica was in here, she's rinsing the Gao, cutting it perfectly, cooking it the right amount of time. Cause that's the other thing I did is overcook it the first time I did it. And so we served that to the elders. And uh, I remember bringing that to an elder who was so tiny and everyone said she would only eat yogurt. And uh, I brought her a bowl and she ate her whole bowl of gao <laughs> in like one minute. It was so amazing. It was just so enjoyed. Um, okay, and then I have some pictures of us um, making some blueberry jam up at the Masset Hospital here. And um, you'll see uh, my colleague, uh, Laura Peterson, who is a speech language pathologist, who has been a wonderful person to partner with, because I'm going to say that texture modifications in long term care become really important when we're serving traditional food. And she's my partner in, in, in fixing the food so it's easy to swallow, even for elders who have trouble swallowing. Um, so for an activity we did this year, we made blueberry jam outside and in the frying pan was some salmon that we had one of our residents go out on a boat with some staff and go and catch and then we were able to cook it up mm -hmm. for, for everybody. Um, and these are some blueberry tarts we made for one um, one month uh, and what was nice about the, the texture of these 
tarts was we could do regular tarts with blueberries inside, but then we also pureed the, the shells and pureed the middle and made a tart really safe for some of our elders. Oh, I put in a big cannon picture. I, I thought, I think that's a mistake of fish. That's fish, pressure can fish on the left, but I thought it was my blueberry jam picture. So that's why I put it in there. But a little bit more of our um, blueberry jam making. You can tell we're in deep in COVID times with our face shields. Um, but this is such a nice activity to be doing and making jam is, is a way to process the food. And a lot of the elders were getting blueberry brought from the nation and uh and so we had piled up in the freezer and so we translated it into blueberry jam for the elders for visits and stuff um this is back in the south end hospital and berries have been a very important thing to bring in that's uh quite quite easy from a food safety perspective we uh, we found that we can have berries freshly picked one day and basically on the tray the next day. And so what you're looking at there is our hospital serving huckleberries. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and we've also, I, I have the good fortune of driving down past a couple of our raspberry and strawberry farms. And so some days I'll just go, they've just picked them in the morning and then we bring them down to the hospital and they're so fresh and and that's the one thing i've learned about food safety and serving food in the hospital the fresher and more seasonal that we're using the less risks there are and so we'll just bring freshly picked they're literally picked the same morning and then they're on the tray at lunch or dinner and then served all weekend so we've been able to work with berries as well um and so this is tong dingwall she's our physiotherapist who um, grew up here on Haida Gwaii and worked in rediscovery camps and has lots of knowledge of traditional food. And she has a background in texture modification. So here she is on the south end making tarts with berries as well, which was a nice, a nice option. Um, so what we're looking at here uh, on the left is uh, we have a resident who really loves to make teriyaki crab. And um, so we've done it a couple times. Uh, and one of my elders and knowledge keepers told me that it's really important to bring their family members to be a part of it too, because they know how to prepare the foods in the right way. So when we did uh, the, the teriyaki crab, we brought a, a resident son in and he prepared it all. Um, and there we are cooking it up and having a good time, cooking all the teriyaki crab. And um, I just want to acknowledge that Margaret's sister there, Emily, is uh, enjoying a feast of crab and that teriyaki crab um, that, uh, you know, it's amazing what people, how many plates of this people can eat. Um, and then another picture of the gao. The other thing I've found is that um, we have a lot of high the staff at the hospital, both north and south, and um, we have people working in the kitchen, people working in the care aid position and nursing, but also uh, housekeeping. And whenever we're cooking traditional food, we have people coming around and really helping how to do it properly. And that, that, uh, that's the one thing I, so uh, it's Colleen Williams up in Masset, who's always present when I'm preparing the traditional food for Masset. And it's just always so reassuring when she's overlooking what we're doing. And Rebecca Vogstead to carry it. And I remember the first time I met her, I, I had brought some gal to an elder and uh, I asked her if she would sit with her to eat while she eats it. And to make sure it was going okay. And she just was so in her comfort. Uh, this is a familiar food for her and, and she knew the elder well, and she just sat and made sure she was fine eating it. And so uh, I, I just ha can't say enough how having our Haida people working in our hospital is such a facilitator of this work. Um, there we're cooking prawns, shelling the prawns. Uh, there's the fish that one of our residents cooked and there's more of our staff preparing the fish. And then uh, another, another day we prepared a seafood chowder with mm -hmm. Kevin Brown and there's just these knowledge keepers in our community again, like 
I don't know how to make the chowder the perfect way, but there are some key people who do. And so Kevin came and helped us make this beautiful seafood chowder. And there's Rebecca again. And then one of the residents shared um, their seaweed with everyone to put it on top. And I think that's my last slide. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and just say, yeah, that, that I think the biggest things that have been facilitators over the last year bringing additional food in to the hospital is working with what's really fresh uh, and coming out of the ocean and getting it right on the plate working with our Haida staff at the hospital and, and pulling people together and, uh, and really bringing in our Haida knowledge keepers to help repair the food. Those have been the, the really big learnings that I've focused on in the last year. So how about for listening? And just wanna see if Margaret has anything to add. I'm just so happy that uh, we're able to be here to share what we know and I thank Shelly for her knowledge and the dietitian and I thank her for making mistakes with the cooking of the cow and I know I've made a few mistakes but not not with the cow. You can't make mistakes with precious Oh, so I know a lot of people when they gave out coal, they they made a big mistake of not rinsing it. And they it turned them off from eating it. So I'm glad that um, people are starting to learn how to cook with it. Oh. Well. Hello. Um, so we're going to turn it to some questions and I do have some questions too, but I'll wait and see if anybody else has uh, any questions before I go. Okay, I'm going to ask an obvious question that might sound silly, but what is Gao? I don't. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer Rogers asked the same question at the same time. So cow is um, herring roe on kelp. So it's the herring eggs that spawn on a specific type of kelp here on Hanuk Wai. They call along the mainland, say Bella Bella area, um, their village, they put hemlock branches in the water oh. so that the herring can spawn on it and they eat it off of the branches. But we here on Hadegwai, we prefer the, the kelp method. And there's also like hairy ones, like on the bottom of the ocean. There's some hairy, um, the, the hairy would spawn on kind of like hairy kelp, it's called. In Haida, we call it kajanda. So that is another prized um, type of cow that we eat. I hope that answers your question. And it's kind of crunchy when you eat it. So our, our people, we either, we have a pot of boiling water and we put ulican grease in there and we drop the, the cow in the pot and we take it out right away because you don't wanna cook it until it turns white because it turns rubbery. So we just basically put it in the pot, take it out and you put butter on it and it's like heaven. Or else you can fry it, like after you've rinsed it, you can fry it in butter and garlic and ginger, which is another really delicious way of preparing it. Oh, a glitch. I have one more question about ulican grease and how that is um, prepared or how it's made. I know you mentioned it in one of our meetings and I was very curious about it. So that is like the fish is um, caught and then fermented. So I don't know like the whole process of that one because that's done by by our First Nations people on the mainland. <clears throat> but basically it's like fermented fish that's turned into oil and it takes quite a long process to make it. 
and it's highly prized. Like different villages have different tastes um, of the Ulukun breeze. Um, there's a question here saying that I have to travel to Haida Gwaii sometimes. And is there a place that I can try some of these traditional foods? There is an elder who has, uh, like she does um, traditional foods from her house. It's called Kinawai's Kitchen. Her name is Roberta Olson. So she serves traditional food, like you pay a certain amount of money for, for your seating. And I think she can hold up to 30 people in her house. That's just a guesstimate. But if you look uh, online and you Google Kina Wise Kitchen, it'll pop up. And her name is Roberta Olson. That's where we're going tomorrow with our knowledge keepers. We're going to have dinner there at her house. Just wondering if you can spell it. Yeah. Uh, I just texted you the link, Meyer. Okay. You want to pop okay. it in there? There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Get in there in a minute there. Thank you. Are there any other questions or anything you'd like to share? Oh, here's one. Prior to first contact, uh, were there any significant sources of carbohydrates in the diet? I'm thinking of berries, uh, but was yours a very low carb diet? Yeah, I would have to say, because we ate a lot of like roots and stuff, like a lot of the plants that we ate. Like, well, can I use, for example, like fireweed, we ate fireweed. Springtime, we had spruce tips and, and um, the shoots from salmon berries. We ate a lot of that. We had a lot of, like, I don't know, we had lots of different plants that we ate. I don't know if they ate it. it oh, we had the, the hide of potato. I'm not sure how far back that goes but we had our hide of potato. And of course we, <clears throat> like when the ships start coming to Haida Gwaii, they brought a lot of the food with them. And there's a story of like when they brought rice and our, our Haida's um, were afraid of it because they thought it was maggots. So they thought the rice was maggots. Is there a wild rice here? Like a rice we don't have rice. wild rice, no. Or just I think there was a plant that I was like a piece of rice. Yeah, I can't see what it's called. Mm -hmm. yeah. But lots of seafood. Yeah, lots of seafood. And Cl there. clams and salmon were our, our main staple. There's a lot of like clam mid in here on Haida Gwaii because our, our people ate so much clams that a lot of the old village sites, like, uh, um, for example, up in Queen Charlotte City, there's a place called the Hana. They have uh, midden beds, clam midden beds there. So wherever there was like a fish camp where our Haida stopped to do their harvesting, there was like, you can find a lot of clam midden. Here's a question um, from Rona. Within long-term care, how frequently are you able to offer traditional foods? Also, given the importance of the foods to holistic health, can you overlook the occasional higher sodium food and such? So um, our health authority uh, and our hospitals have a, a policy that allows us to serve fish every week. Um, so the halibut and the salmon uh, can get donated. We have some CFIA processing plants on island and processors that um, uh, package up the fish and prepare it for the hospital kitchen. So that's been happening for a number of years and that and they can get on the menu pretty much every week or every second week. Um, and then we tend to try to do these 
uh, what we call the recreational meals once a month. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so our long-term care um, gets to choose if they wanna participate in, and not, and the sodium doesn't feel like an important factor for most of our long-term care residents uh, living there. Um, but what we'll do when we have um, other residents in the hospital at that time is we'll just check to see if the, they're safe to have the food based on why they're in the hospital. And that'll just be the role of the dietitian. But um, yeah, we don't, we don't often worry about the salt content or uh, I would say the bigger thing we, we really focus on is the texture modification to keep it really safe. All right, so miigwech for sharing and thank you for sharing all those stories. Um, I think we'll start to move to the close. Um, and if you have any more questions or comments, you can feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, so if we could share the slides again. Um, I'd like to finish with some quotes and thank yous from um, our participants. And I'm going to be reading from my second computer, so it looks like I'm staring up at the sky, but um, I'm just reading from the other computer. Um, the Food is Our Medicine course has inspired me to develop a major project in our food service management course, and that's from Ruth Harvey at St. Francis um, Xavier University. Thank you for generously sharing your wisdom and gifts. I read, I read many eloquent, inspirational, challenging, uplifting, and enlightening quotes during the journey. And that's from Elaine um, Epler um, from Vancouver Coastal Health. And the Nourish course has turned my thinking upside down and inside out. This course and its impactful resources helped me to do so much unlearning as a public health dietitian. And that's from Catherine at Gray Bruce Health Unit. Um, she's also a public health dietitian. Um, Phoebe Lee from Black Creek Community Health Center says, I highly recommend that everyone takes Nourishes Food as Our Medicine course. We need to embrace the idea of combining wisdoms from Western Indigenous, Indigenous and Eastern cultures. So with that, on our next slide, um, I'd like to, to share a video um, saying uh, thank you from Brittany Gauthier. Um, and we will continue to capture and share on our website the thoughts and um, thank yous uh, as they come in. So don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Ani, Brittany Deshnikaz, Mishpakot and First Nation Donjaba, North Bay Donda, Anishinaabe Kwayan Dao. Hi folks, I'm here to congratulate you today on completing your four-part learning journey as part of the Nourish Food is Our Medicine campaign. As part of finishing the Nourish Food is Our Medicine campaign, you'll be gifted with a pin. These beaded pins were handmade by me and all of them include a spirit bead. So that means one or two white beads placed purposefully outside of the pattern. The reason we play spirit beads is to acknowledge, honor, and recognize the spirits within our beadwork and around us. As part of the seven grandfather teachings, placing a spirit bead practices humility. Thank you for completing your learning journey. Encourage your coworkers to take part in the Food is Our Medicine campaign. Bama P. So with that, I'd like to um, offer a smudge for a close and hopefully everybody goes off and enjoys some part of an um, Indigenous Day celebration in your area. It's nice that people are actually able to get together now too. So happy about that. I think Margaret maybe trying to say something. Oh, yeah. sorry, Margaret. Yeah, sorry. I should have said something before. That's all right. Oh.
yes, the um, food is our medicine. It's so important to acknowledge because uh, a few of our, our elders were healed with um, elderberries. One, one elder had a hole in her heart and she was too, too old to get an operation. So she had my sister and I go picking elderberries for her and she ate a tablespoon morning breakfast, lunch and supper. And I think it happened for about a week or two. Went back to the doctor and the doctor looked, checked her over and she had nothing wrong with her anymore. The doctor asked her, what did you do? I'm not telling, I'm not sharing my knowledge with you. And um, Shiwi too is one of the most important ones, especially for people that are low, their blood is um, low or they have um, low iron. So you have to acknowledge that and make sure that our people have a lot of um, food with iron and seaweed is one of the most important ones. Okay, that's it. End of story. No rush, Margaret. Miigwech for sharing. Sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, my, um, I was covered with my notes here. <laughs> so I just lit the smudge and it was burning really good for, for Margaret to share too. So that was really meant to be. Miigwech everybody for sharing time with us today and miigwech to Jenny and Margaret and Shelly for sharing and uh, for everybody for coming. So enjoy the rest of your day.